a potential relationship super confident about your expertise in whatever niche this one specifically amazon and brand partnerships and managing brands on amazon when you could go into that with the confidence that you know what you're doing and you can basically guarantee that this brand will grow i mean that just takes the opportunity to a whole new level welcome fellow entrepreneurs to the amazon sellers school podcast where we talk about Amazon Wholesale and how you can use it to build an e-commerce empire, a side hustle, and anything in between. And now, your host, Todd Welch. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to uh, another episode of Amazon Scout Seller School. Today, I've got Eric Castellano with me, and he's known on the socials as Amazon Lit. So some of you have probably seen his uh, information and such out there, but he's been selling on Amazon for over 10 years, sold over $500 million with his uh, business partner, Sebastian. Uh, they do a lot of wholesale, but also some private labels, some bundles, and they've been moving into a lot of brand exclusive partnerships, which we're really going to dive into on this episode. So Eric, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, Todd, excited to be here and kind of dive into it, man. Really looking forward to it. Yeah. Why don't you just give us the uh, high level overview real quick of your background and how you got started selling on Amazon? Yeah. So, you know, you, you brought up Sebastian. That's my business partner. I've known Sebastian for 20 plus years. Um, and back in 2013-ish, you know, he started buying products from retail arbitrage from Costco, BJ Sam's Club, and, and reselling them on Amazon. And when he first told me about it, I literally laughed in his face. I was like, <laughs> dude, no way are you. Um, but he met someone who ended up buying a house from selling on Amazon. So that was his motivation. Nice. And, nice. Uh, and we started in a small little basement like most people do out of their home or garage. Um, and we just kind of kept scaling it from there and got our first warehouse. And now here we are 10 years later in warehouse number six. I mean, we have a 50 employee team. We ship close to 300,000 orders a month. I mean, and like you said, we're branching into other avenues to generate additional revenue and profit for our company. Yeah, for sure. I'm curious, uh, how, how big of a warehouse do you guys have? Uh, it's about 50,000 square feet of warehouse. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. About 10 times bigger than mine then. Mine's about 5,000 <laughs> square feet. So. Yeah, but what's, what state are you in? Uh, we're down here in Florida. Oh, okay. So rent is, is still pretty reasonable down there in Florida. Not yeah. too bad. It's getting a little yeah. high near you know Tampa and Miami areas. Yeah, but. yeah. Where are you guys at again? We're, we're in New Jersey and rent's ridiculous up here. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah, that's got to be yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But very good. So you've grown it uh, very large, which is awesome. And kind of a similar path as I had, retail arbitrage and you know flipping out of my basement and growing from there. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, you guys are doing a majority right now wholesale uh, with some private label bundles and brand partnerships. So uh, tell us a little bit more about that mix and you know why you're moving into more brand partnerships. Yeah. So definitely a majority of our business, you are correct, is still a uh, wholesale. And I think there's still a lot of opportunity with wholesale. You know, there's tens of thousands of brands out there produced by some rather large manufacturers like Unilever, Procter & Gamble, Reckitt and Ben Kisser, where they're not really interested in partnering with one. So there'll always be wholesale opportunity. But what we've noticed, and I'm sure others have noticed, is the margins are always super tight. And all it takes is a few mistakes or misbuys or removal orders or disposal orders to really eat up your profits if you're not operating your wholesale business correctly. So about four or five years ago, we started branching out into brand exclusive relationships where we build relationships with these brands and then represent these brands on Amazon and optimize their listings, run PPC campaigns, image, everything. We do everything. Yeah. And you have that, your team that does that in-house then you've hired or do you outsource that? Uh, no, it's all, it's all pretty much in-house. I mean, we have some VAs who help with some listing issues um, on the back end, but other than that, uh, all the listings are created in-house. Yeah. 
I mean, all the all the analyzation of the data for estimated sales and which listings should be created for new bundles or variety packs is all done in-house, 100%. Okay, very good. And do you hire mostly here in the United States or you got a yes. lot of VAs as well? No, no. We, uh, I would say 90% of our staff is, is U.S.-based, which is about 50 employees. And then we have, you know, another seven or eight overseas. Okay. Very nice. Yeah. Now, as far as like listing uh, creation for like infographics, like I, I just pay somebody, uh, a guy overseas to take care of stuff like that, you know? Okay. Very good. So what is your, what is your guys's kind of secret sauce when it comes to actually finding and acquiring these brand exclusives and being yeah. the only seller of the products? Yeah. I think really the secret sauce is the, the confidence, right? The confidence, but here's the, the secret of the secret sauce is the confidence comes from experience, mm -hmm. right? So I think when you can go into a relationship or a potential relationship, super confident about your expertise in whatever niche, this one specifically Amazon and brand partnerships and managing brands on Amazon, when you can go into that with the confidence that you know what you're doing and you can basically guarantee that this brand will grow, I mean, that just takes the opportunity to a whole new level. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there, there's so many products, especially doing wholesale that you come across that's like, man, if I could only optimize this list, yes. it would just be yeah. killing it. So yeah. is that how you found a lot of your brand partnerships? Like you were selling their products already and then you built that relationship over time or other ways than that? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, a lot of them come from that products that we're selling, buying from distributors and wholesalers that we we're buying just general wholesale from, and then we're like, "Wow, we've been buying this product a lot. Like, maybe we can establish a connect, uh, direct relationship with this brand and really enhance their whole entire brand on Amazon to make them more money and make us more money and really optimize everybody's shopping experience mm -hmm. on Amazon." But another software that we use, or another skill we use to acquire some of these brands is Smart Scout, okay, um, which is an amazing software. A good friend of mine, Scott Needham, created, who I'm sure you're familiar with, and uh, you know it really helps sort the data. You know, for and the recommended sort would be like twenty to one hundred thousand dollars in monthly sales revenue, right? So you're not you're not targeting like the Huggies, you know, these massive brands. You're looking for those small, medium sized brands to really take. Yes, exactly. I, I like to say that if you went to the mall and mentioned a brand name to someone, like maybe one out of 10 or probably yeah. zero out of 10 would know that brand. Yeah. Small, small, yeah. right? Maybe, but maybe nice presence on, on e-commerce, not really in many stores yet, or maybe the opposite in a lot of stores, not a heavy presence on e-commerce. Yep. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I think that's a big mistake a lot of people make. They're going after Huggies or Nike yes. and yeah. stuff like that. And then they're like, why can't I open accounts and stuff like that? It's like, well, they're way too big. They're <laughs> they're not paying attention to Amazon for the most part a lot of times. So yeah. Or they're doing it themselves. Yeah. And I mean, realistically, the way I see it, Todd, is like, let's just say you take on one small brand and it's bringing in 50K a month. Mm -hmm. right? In sales revenue. I mean, it's not unrealistic for brand partnerships to operate, you know, 10, 12, 15% net because the margins you maintain them and you're the only seller on all the listings. So, I mean, one brand at 15% net, 50K a month, that's 7,500 a month, mm -hmm. you know, times 12 months, you're talking 90K a year, just with one brand, you get two or three of those, you, you're multiple six figure business owners. Yep, absolutely. And so you guys have been able to maintain higher margins like that because uh, companies like Pattern, I've heard that they're doing like maybe 3% margin on some of their big brands that they're working with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously not the the same for every single brand. Certain brands you could obviously get a, a higher premium for, but definitely the brand direct relationships, 10 to 15% is is definitely par for the course. Yeah. Yeah. You know, now, sure. obviously, general wholesale. Yeah. I mean, we're three, 5%, you know, 6% on a good day. 
Yeah. And so for your general wholesale, you guys have kind of seen an increase in competition there. And that's why you're moving away, though. Well, no, we're not moving away. I mean, we're still very heavily invested. I mean, probably four and a half million of our monthly sales is still wholesale. So, okay. I mean, it drives a lot of the business growth. It drives the capital that we use to put up for brand direct relationships and private label. So absolutely, we use it as like the cash cow to keep the operation moving. Yeah, for sure. I In, in the last year, I've seen about a a 10% drop in my ROI in the general wholesale yes. with yeah. an increase in the brand partnerships, because then you're not having to compete directly on price. You got yes. to keep the brand happy, obviously. Yes. So you can't sell it at astronomical prices. Uh, yeah. You got to find that balance of profit and quantity sold. Yeah. And, and then the, the real goal would be like to get them to pay for ads, right? Like I have some brands right now giving me, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars a month in ad spend. So I mean that's mm -hmm. massive because now they're invested and now optimization, as long as the ads are running smooth, I mean, the sky's the limit. Yeah, yeah. I think running ads is a, a big problem that people have and, and you want to try to get the brand to pay for it because that can really cut into your profit otherwise. A hundred percent. I mean, when you look at some of the brands we manage and you take away ads, it's like, all right, maybe, I mean, it's still healthy, but it's like, all right, maybe this is, this is, but then you put that, you know, 10 K a month in ad spent back in and you're like, all right, this is actually really fucking good. Yeah, for sure. You know? And so on the, the brand side, uh, why do you think the brands decide to work with someone like you or myself instead of just doing it themselves? Um, because it's a lot of work, I think, you know, um, as you know, you operate Amazon business and I'm sure most people who listen to this operate Amazon businesses and it's not simple. It's not like one day you just open up a seller's storefront and start creating all these optimized listings and shipping your inventory and manage your returns properly and deal with customer feedback. And like, it's, it's a lot of work and most brands don't have the knowledge on how to do it or don't care enough to want to do it themselves. Yeah, I would, I would agree, especially for those middle size, small to medium sized brands, right. That maybe don't have enough profit or income in their business to hire a full team. Yeah. and learn Amazon. It can be a, yeah. a, a real nightmare. Just dealing with seller support, as I'm yeah. sure you know, can just be ridiculous. Yeah. And, th and that's a huge selling point, right? Because it's like, hey, listen, you have a phenomenal product. Your brand is amazing. You focus on the brand, creating a few new SKUs, optimizing your current SKUs. I'll focus on the Amazon side selling the product. Exactly. Yeah, take that all off of them, allow them to just treat Amazon like any other retail store yeah. that they're selling to and and not have to worry about it. Yeah, yeah. Because you got to think about it like this, right? If I can, let's say 10x their sales over the course of the next 12 to 18 months, right? It's like how much more, all right, so they could do it themselves and keep a little bit of the margin that right now I'm keeping mm -hmm. and have a tenth of the sales, right? Or let's just say they double it and have a fifth of the sales, or they can eliminate that additional margin that they'd keep by operating it themselves, sell it to me wholesale, not have to deal with anything and sell 10 times more of the inventory. Yep. Yep. And they get their money, you know, a lot quicker in bulk, yeah. whatever the net terms you are, you have. Yeah. Do you typically do net terms or you do any kind of consignment? Um, both. Both. So interestingly enough, we just got our largest consignment shipment is three containers. So, I mean, it's, it's like over 70 pallets and we just got it last week and they basically said, Hey, just take this inventory, sell it as it goes. When you sell it at the end of the month, you pay us for it. So it's yeah, cool. yeah. I think that's kind of the, the Holy grail if you're able yeah. to do it, because that really helps the cash flow. Cause that's typically yeah. the hardest thing in a, in a wholesale business is managing yeah. cash flow. Yeah. Um, but the extended net terms with typically you'll be able to push, you know, 45 days, sometimes even 60. I mean, most wholesalers, they're going to start you maybe 14, you know, bump you to 21. Some will get you to 28, 30. But I mean, the brands are a little more generous. 
Yeah. Yeah. I've got uh, a lot of net thirties, some net 45s, some net sixties, even a couple net nineties. So the yeah. further you can push that out, the help, better it's going to help with your cash flow. What would be your main, uh, I know we talked about smart scout and leveraging existing relationships. What, is there any additional ways that you're currently locking in some of these brands, Todd? Uh, definitely smart scout. We've started using that a lot, uh, being yeah. able to filter, you know, on the, the quality of the listings and stuff yeah. like that is really nice. Uh, but in addition to that, I've just had, uh, going to trade shows can mm-hmm. be really good research Absolutely. them in advance and find the ones that their products are selling good on Amazon, but their listings are really bad. And you know, you can yeah. easily double their sales. Um, so that's worked really well for us as well. But otherwise just, you know, like you said, distributors and finding products that you can sell well, and then trying to build those relationships. Yeah. hundred percent. Some the of trade the shows Yeah, for sure. So once you're getting these brand exclusives, are you signing some type of agreement with them? In a perfect world, yeah, we'd love a, an agreement, but not every company's open to to signing one. You know, we've we I actually just had a phone call right before this meeting with one of our larger brand directs. Uh, we've had an exclusive with them for nearly three years, and they just they just won't sign a contract, and we're okay with it because the relationship is very solid. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, definitely agreement is ideal, but as long as you have that good relationship, especially with the owner, you know, you know, like, and trust each other, Yeah, well, that can go a long ways, uh, even further than having an, an agreement in place. Yeah. 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 So you're aiming for the agreements. Uh, are you, uh, then once you sign on a new brand partnership, um, are you immediately just jumping in and starting to optimize all of their listings or how does that process? Are you looking for certain listings that you're focusing on? Yeah, we're definitely starting with, there's two things we're typically looking out for. Obviously the best sellers and then the ones that are getting just, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess just, uh, I guess trashed by other, I, that's not the word I'm looking for. I mean, just demolished, right? The listings, just price tanking, thousands of sell, like it just where it's ridiculous, you know, and it needs some cleaning up. Those are the two main focuses because you never want to go too aggressive because you don't always know that it's going to be the right fit for you either. I've taken a lot of poor brand relationships on in the past where I spent way too much time enhancing, optimizing PPC, like, and it just wasn't worth the squeeze. Yep. Yeah. Focus on the the top selling ones for sure. Now, the ones that have a bunch of other sellers on it, how do you guys work to get those sellers off of there? Oh, well, first step would obviously be brand registry, right? You, you definitely want to, because you give you get a little more control with the listing when you, when you set up brand registry. Um, and then obviously you could go the route, which is the unpreferred route, which is getting a lawyer or a, an attorney involved and sending the letters and the cease and desist. And you, I know me, I, I ignore those. I'm sure you ignore those when you get them. I mean, and then the other only really way to, to essentially do that would be 2D transparency. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Transparency. We've started using that as well. Works. Quite well yeah. for the most part, if you can get all of their listings to register in the brand registry. But I found sometimes like half of them will go in and the other half, there's some problem in the back end and it won't accept them. But that's yeah. pretty much the only surefire way to to get all the other sellers off. That's the only way. And it's you're right. Sometimes those errors do happen. And it's typically because the brand name doesn't match the brand name that's registered with brain registry. Yeah, that's a common one. But I've, I've also seen them where it's like you'll have a brand store set up, for example, and a majority of the listings will say, you know, click here to visit the brand store. Yeah. And then other ones, the brand name's exactly the same, but it just says brand colon the name and you click on it and it doesn't go to the store. Yeah. For whatever reason, I'm not sure what the glitch is, but you got to keep hammering seller support over the head to get it to fix or brand registry support is yeah, really good is, as well. Which is a nightmare, which we all know, just the back and forth. Yep, for sure. So yeah, for sure. So brand partnerships and is probably, is that becoming one of your highest 
profitable sides of your business or do you see more bundles and private label being more profitable? No, no, definitely the the brand partnerships are, are up there. I mean, the bundling is, is definitely fruitful as well. That's why we put a huge focus on it. Um, but I mean, the, the bundling, you're kind of starting from scratch versus taking, I mean, not necessarily because you're leveraging brand names that exist already, but I mean, it's just a little different ball game than, than the brand. So let's dive into the the bundles a little bit because I I have a lot of fun building bundles. How are you guys yeah. uh, finding those and ideas for bundles to build? Yeah, so typically we like to see what customers are shopping for and buying frequently together, you know, to figure out uh, bundles that could potentially crush. And also we're looking for what other people are doing, right? What are other people bundling with certain products? Um, and then before we create any bundles, we want to make sure that the sellers on the listing aren't the brand, aren't Amazon dominating the buy box to make sure that if I'm going to go through and spend the time to create these listings and get the images and optimize the SEO, that it's not going to get immediately removed after yeah. it goes live, you know? Yeah, for sure. That's, uh, I was just talking to a, a couple, uh, we had a kind of a coaching session and they were selling uh, some stuff from, I believe it was Fisher Price brand, and they kept getting taken down. You know, they yeah. were packaging stuff that goes along with it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you can, when you start using those trademark terms, the automated bots can take down your listing pretty quickly sometime. Yes, absolutely, man. Absolutely. You know, but but I think what what a lot of people do early on, Todd, and and because we're talking about a lot of different things, right? The brand partnerships, the wholesale arbitrage in the beginning, and now bundles. I think what people do in the beginning is they spread themselves too thin. You know, they listen to something like this, and they're like, "Oh, I need a brand partnership. I need to create brand." And like, no, just focus on the build a business to a million bucks first, and then start yeah. branching into these other things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I had to coach someone, I would say start with wholesale yes. because that's kind of the low hanging fruit and then create some of your own bundles and get experience yeah. building listings, creating graphics, doing yeah. search engine optimization, PPC. And then you've got all those skills that you can go out and get those brand partnerships and yeah. hopefully you've made some relationships along the way. Yes. hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, it teaches you a lot about the industry and how Amazon operates and what a good listing is. Just those initial, you know, multiple months of doing what you just said. I couldn't agree more. For sure. Now, with the bundles that you guys are making, are you putting those under your own brand name or under the brand name of the product? No, no. Typically, we, we do our own trademark. Okay, cool. And a value add. Yeah. And are you typically getting permission from the brands of the products you're putting in the bundles? Sometimes. Okay. But otherwise you haven't had too much of an issue with listings getting taken down? No, about 30% of them get removed. Yeah. Again, it kind of goes back to that sticking with the smaller brands, right? If they're yeah. smaller brands, they're typically not going to care too much. No, no. And it's a numbers game, you know, still, even if Say you create 100 listings, 30 of them get removed, but out of the other 70, half of them crush. I mean, mm -hmm. it's worth it. Yeah, for sure. And are you, what's kind of your profit margin that you're looking for on a bundle? 20% uh, gross. Oh, it's got to be over that. I mean, I wouldn't definitely don't want to take less than that. I mean, if I want to take less than that, I'd just buy more general wholesale. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we do a lot of the bundles as well. It's a great, great way to kind of increase ROI and profit margin yeah. for sure. You can even a lot of times sell bundles at a higher price than the individual products inside just because you're making that convenience, especially if you yeah. can make an awesome listing and the individual products maybe are kind of crappy listings. Yeah. And I mean, the way I see it, because you, you said it best, it's like, even if you increase your margins on average across the board, across the entire year, a couple points, I mean, a $2 million business, every point your business goes up in margin is 20 grand, yep. you know? So yep. you, you make a three point increase. I mean, you're talking 60 K. I mean, that's a nice chunk of change. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it can, it can snowball pretty quickly if you really stick to it and you're building uh, a lot of bundles over uh you know the course of the year you could grow that yeah. really quickly 
a hundred percent, man. And then at the end of the year, all of a sudden, fifteen percent, you know, of your business is a higher margin, and and it's more, uh, you know, fortified, I guess you could say, because you're making those bundles on your own brand. Maybe you're putting something extra in that bundle that you know you have trademarked or copyrighted or something like that. And so you don't have to worry about other people jumping on those listings and competing with you driving down the price. Yeah, which I think is better for everybody. I mean, as far as the customer experience, I know for me, when I shop on Amazon, and I like there's some things I buy all the time, right? Toothpaste, it's essentials, the everyday stuff, right? And I don't like when I go and I buy it one day, it's fourteen ninety nine, and then two weeks later when I go to replant, it's nineteen ninety nine. It's like keep the price at least somewhat consistent for me, you know? Yeah, yeah, for <laughs> sure. Or even more frustrating, you buy it at twenty bucks and then you go back and it's like ten bucks. It's like yeah. oh, crap, yeah. I got ripped off. Yeah. And the brands don't like that either. So if the the brand is seeing that and their retail customers are seeing that is driving them crazy. So that's another reason the brands should partner with, you know, people like us us and have us do their listings for them. Yeah. And what's even worse is out of stock. You go back to reorder and it's not even there. Yeah, for sure. Um, So, yeah, that actually leads me down another path that we can talk about real quick. Uh, What kind of software stack do you guys use to uh, manage your reordering and restocking Amazon? Yeah, two things. The first one is our repricer. Um, we've been, we've built our own in-house repricer, but for years, seller snap, you know, I think is, I think it's one of the most rep- robust reporting repricers on the market space. Yep. Um, and then number two would be source correct which is um, our own proprietary software that we built and is available to some members of our uh, inner circle. Um, And it's basically a UPC scraper, purchase order creation, listing creation on Amazon, hazmat check, like everything to printing FN SKUs, 2D box content labels, like the entire process from start to finish. Okay, nice. So you built your guys' own internal tool that you're using for all of the reordering and purchase orders and sources yeah. and such. Yeah, correct. All right, cool. Very good. For people who obviously don't have the capital to build their own software, do you have any recommendations for like inventory management software, stuff like that? Yeah. So seller board is great inventory uh, management. I mean, to kind of understand your numbers and see where your inventory is. And then when I, when it comes to reordering, I mean, seller legends, another option, there's a lot of the sellers, seller board, seller legend, seller cloud. I mean, they all pretty much do the same thing. It's just basically user and price preference. Mm -hmm. Um, But I know a lot of people in our community use seller cloud. And then as far as reordering goes, I think most people overcomplicate it. I mean, 95% of our reordering uh, happens through our repricer. I mean, because the repricer has all the historical sales data of your reordering and and what needs to take place with how much inventory you have left, how many estimated days of sales, you know, what your profit margin was. I mean, it has all the information. Yeah, that's true. We use SellerSnap for the repricer and they've got a lot yeah. of really good information in there for yeah. restocking and such. Yeah. Just the filtering and stuff that's in SellerSnap makes it worth the uh, you know 500 bucks a month or whatever it is. Yeah, the way I see it, it's like an employee, man. And you can't get an employee for $6,000 a year to do what a, a software like SellerSnap does. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I definitely recommend Seller Snap. I, I use Be Cool. I recommend I'll Be Cool if you want something cheap, newer, yeah, bucks to a hundred bucks. I concur. You can upgrade to Seller Snap. It's definitely one of the best out there. Yeah, I mean it's worth it. I typically say if you're doing over twenty, twenty five k a month, I mean it's worth worth the upgrade. Yep, for sure. So let's see, as far as, um, you know, getting started, someone who's brand new has never sold anything on Amazon. What would you tell them as far as getting started? Is there still enough opportunity to start now and grow a business or where are you at on that? No, hell yeah. There's still opportunity, man. I've been getting asked that question for years and years and years, ever since I started. And my answer is the same. It was for the past 10 years in a row. 
absolutely it's not too late. And the best time to start today and the worst time to wait to start is tomorrow. Because, I mean, every day you wait to go by, you're missing out on opportunity. And most importantly, you're missing out on those weeks and months that it's going to initially take to build that momentum. Yeah. Right. So the yeah. longer you push it off, the longer it won't happen. Yeah, no, I I definitely agree. And I, you know, a lot of people don't like it, but I think it's a good thing that Amazon is getting more uh, requirements to open an account. They're forcing people to make this a legitimate business. You know, it's not some kind of fly by night to make a million dollars in the next month kind of thing. And they're forcing people to have insurance and have a business bank account and all this stuff to be yeah. more legit. So it's going to make it harder for the people who are just trying to take advantage and make a quick buck. But for anybody looking to build a real business, uh, the opportunity is still there for sure. Yeah. And you see that with their new fee infrastructure as well. It basically everything about their new fee changes that are going into place March or February, March, and April, everything about them says legitimate business, like operate a legitimate business. Because if you treat it like a side hustle, some of these removal fees, disposal fees, I mean, they'll kill new businesses if you don't know what you're doing. For sure. 100%. And so where do you where do you see your guys' business five years from now? Hopefully sold and not doing. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, that would be great if someone gave me a phenomenal, gave us a phenomenal offer. But I mean, obviously, we'd like to continue to grow. I mean, our initial goal for two years out was to to break the hundred million dollar mark. Uh, but one thing we've realized is as we get bigger, you know, we this year we wrapped up right around seventy. I mean, we noticed that it's just that much more challenging to manage everything with the margins and. I mean, so I think now our focus is just to continue to scale profits. And then five years from now, I'd like to mainly be brand exclusive with a lot less SKUs, mm-hmm. um, preferably actually maybe even scaled down, scaled back operation, um, just focusing on the the key fruitful items. Yeah. You know, there's something to be said. You, you can sell a hundred million and make 5% profit versus selling, you know, 25 million and maybe get 10, 15% profit on that. Sometimes selling less at a higher profit is better. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and, and we're always, that's the constant thing we're always analyzing in our business. You know, Hey, if we throw an extra 50,000 orders a month in sales, at our company, like what's it going to do to the impact of inventory management and profit? Yeah. You know, so it's like we always analyze that and, and then we make decisions and, and integrate and change as we see the adjustments happening. Yep, absolutely. And that, that just made me think of a, another good question. When you are bringing on a brand, new brand partnership, are you carrying all of their products? Let's say they've got, you know, 100, 200 different products that are on Amazon, or are you taking just a select few? Definitely depends on the relationship. You know, it depends on what their requirements are, because it's not just about, obviously, I'm the expert and they're going to ask for my opinion. Um, But also some brands, they prefer to have their entire product line. Now, I typically try to shy away from that as to any cause possible i mean because you know how complicated it is to create hundreds of listings especially when they don't sell and then you're faced with the decision do you leave them at your warehouse fbm and just slowly when one person a month orders this one product just so it's available or do you send them to fba and incur storage fees so i mean the preferred method is no you know do not take an entire product line unless it's required to kind of secure the relationship. And then you have to make that decision if it's worth it still. Yep. Yep. But for sure, focus on the big ones and kind of work your way down from there. Yeah. Yeah. And don't be shy also to create new listings for the brand. I mean, that's been one of the most fruitful things for us is they get new products and we also, we immediately take them to market, you know, before anybody else. And sometimes they do a lot of their testing through Amazon as well for new products to create. Yeah, absolutely. And and a lot of times they'll have a lot of background data from their retail stores that, hey, this product is selling really good in the stores yeah. and it's not on Amazon and you can be the one to launch it for them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And now with like TikTok and influencers, I mean, the the, the limits are really endless. 
Yep, for sure. All right. Well, perfect, Eric. This has been really great. Uh, do you have any uh, final thoughts uh, for people that are listening that we haven't touched on? No, I mean, if you're if you're kind of in the beginning phases of your business, I mean, just keep going and take time to kind of get that snowball effect. One or two good brand direct relationships, one or two solid wholesale relationships can really, really help your business explode in 10x in the next 12 months. So don't quit before the miracle happens. And a great trade show coming up that we will be at. We'd love to see a lot of you at is right around the corner. ASD hopping in in in, uh, in March in Las Vegas. Absolutely. Yep. I couldn't agree more. Where can people connect with you? Uh, Amazonlit.com on Google, or you could simply Instagram Amazon underscore lit. We'd love to, you know, send me a message, connect. There's a support on our, on our website. We're here for your support. Awesome. Sounds good, Eric. Well, I appreciate you coming on. You have a great one. Thanks, Todd. I'll see you. This has been another episode of the Amazon Seller School podcast. Thanks for listening, fellow Amazon seller. And always remember, success is yours if you take it.